Should we? Do you think it's too soon? I don't know. I think we should. I mean, why not? Okay, but we can't get upset if it's negative. Alicia and I had been trying to get pregnant for a few months with no luck. It was becoming clear that events of this nature rarely happen according to a set plan. We reminded ourselves that things take time. The doctor said a year or more was common. Okay, we are supposed to wait for three minutes. But I don't think we have to. Really? touch anything, are you? No. Our first appointment went as expected, and we got to see our little blob for the first time. The doctor had an interesting observation. Hmm. You don't have a history of twins in your family, do you? It looks like you tried to ovulate from both ovaries, but I only see one baby. Despite the shock the doctor gave us, the first appointment went well. Our pregnancy was now officially confirmed, and although we didn't hear a heartbeat or see much more than a grayish mass, we were ecstatic. Alicia was so happy she wasn't even upset for the first of many blood withdrawals. <laughs> Morning sickness is, in my opinion, one of the worst named side effects in the history of modern medicine. It should be called forever sickness. What started off as a general queasy feeling, you know, I don't feel too well, hmm. turned into something much worse. Stop the car. Choose less bumpy roads. We decided to try out a variety of ways recommended via the internet to put a stop to, or at least help, with all the sickness. We tried out all manner of peppermint products ranging from teas, gum, to aromatherapy oils to saturate the room in pure peppermint scents. We went so far as to try these strange acupressure wristbands often used to help with seasickness. You really think those things are going to help? Trust me, you would try them too if you felt like this. For a time, these techniques provided some comfort. That is, until the aversions began. Alicia soon discovered the mere hint of anything peppermint related would send her into an instantaneous vomit. All mint foods and scents were banned from the house. What's in your mouth? Mm, nothing. Mm. 
We even had to switch out our toothpaste. In the end, the only thing that really helped with morning sickness was drinking plenty of fluids and snacking on small amounts of food all throughout the day and night. Along with the sickness, other pregnancy side effects began to crop up. As the days went by, Alicia became increasingly emotional. Look at this card, it's so sweet. Are you watching babies again? Yeah. I'm going to head to the grocery store. Okay. Hello? Are you okay? When are you coming home? I've only been gone 20 minutes, sweetheart. I'll be home soon. I'm home! I was worried something terrible had happened to you. Okay, the blood work came back and I think I might have some big news for you two. Your HCG levels were high, which sometimes means twins, so let's take a look. Well, it appears that there's two gestational sacs, but I'm still only seeing one baby. So, no twins? Nope, but your body tried. Do you want to hear your baby's heartbeat? There's little that could prepare you for moments like this. And like Alicia, I was finding myself becoming increasingly emotional. Should we? Yeah, I feel comfortable with this. Me too. Okay, here it goes. I thought morning sickness was supposed to end around this time, but apparently not for me. New symptoms were beginning to show, not the least of which was back pain. I have to throw up again. I also developed Ugh. an aversion to water. The only way I could hold down fluids was if they were flavored in some way. My go-to drink was water with a twist of lemon. Due to Alicia's severe nausea, the task fell to me to keep the house in working order. I soon developed a skill for multitasking I never knew I had. I eventually reached a state of calm preparedness I came to think of as the Zen of Dad. I began to feel a sense that I had everything under control, and more so, I was becoming ready for the responsibilities of parenthood. You're so good to me. I am the water that flows with the tide. What did you say? Nothing. About two weeks into the second trimester, my morning sickness began to go away. I had resolved myself to the possibility of never feeling good again, and this newfound vitality allowed me to enjoy my pregnancy physically as well as emotionally. We were getting close to the halfway mark and the fast approaching anatomy scan where we would finally be able to tell the sex. Anxious to find out, we took to the internet to try out some old wives' tales. The first test involved urinating on baking soda. If it fizzed, it signaled a boy, and no fizz meant a girl. Ours didn't fizz. Next was the acne test. If a woman has acne, it's a girl, if not, then a boy. One point for boy. The key test supposes if a pregnant woman is offered a key and grabs it from the narrow end, She's having a girl. I grabbed narrow. The Mayan gender test has the mother's age at conception added to the year of conception. Even means girl, odd is a boy. If your baby has a heartbeat of 140 or above, it's a girl. One more point for girl. The extreme morning sickness test says if you have it past the first trimester, it's a girl. I don't think I have to tell you how that one turned out. Here's an odd one. If you hang a ring from a string and it swings in a circle, you're having a boy. If it swings back and forth, then it's a girl. Our swung back and forth. Finally, there's the go-to test involving how you carry. If you carry high, it's a girl, and low, it's a boy. 
In the end, we scored two for boy and five for girl. At 13 weeks, we went in for our third ultrasound scan in order to run a few standard tests on the baby. We were told it would be too early to get a definitive answer on what the sex would be, but asked the doctor to give a guess. She guessed girl. We were told not to get too excited, as it was still a little early. At around 15 weeks, our little girl was the size of an orange, according to the baby fruit chart. We were very excited and started thinking Alicia was beginning to show. Someone offered me their seat on the bus. I guess I'm beginning to show. When you're going through something this life-changing, the world around you changes too. We began noticing pregnant women everywhere. Your ears perk up at the mere mention of babies. It was exciting to feel part of a club of moms as people around me began noticing my belly. Around this time, Eric and I began feeling the nesting impulses kicking in. Shopping at baby stores became a weekly affair. The world of child rearing has become surprisingly high tech. We saw children's toys that require smartphones, strollers that can tell you how long you've walked and give you weather updates along the way, baby monitors that send video via Wi-Fi, not to mention the mesmerizing swings that hypnotize every passerby. I was drawn to the children's books as fond memories started rushing back to me. The realization came to me that I was about to be able to introduce someone else to all these fantastic stories. On the other end of the store, Alicia was having similar feelings. Look at this one! Cute! So cute! Cute! We flew home with all our new baby stuff, and each week more was collected. Our bedroom was transforming into the baby's room as we selected swatches of color and began to decorate. This was when I went through the rite of passage all fathers-to-be are subjected to, putting together the furniture. Why would they do this to me? Why? 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 Come here, I just felt her. Wow. We had told everyone we knew our baby would be a girl, and we're quite sure of it of ourselves, but we couldn't help but feel a slight bit of apprehension as we waited for the ultrasound technician to give us a definite answer. It's a girl. <sighs> in a few weeks, I was scheduled to spend a month in the Australian Outback as part of field work required for my dissertation. I needed to get approval from my doctor in order to convince the university I was fit for travel. She agreed. If I am careful and smart, I should be fine. I bought my tickets that week. It was hard to know Alicia would be on the other side of the world and pregnant without me. Nevertheless, we knew well ahead of time that this trip was a possibility, so I had to come to terms with it. Promise me you won't carry anything heavy. And don't overexert yourself. If you need to take a break, let someone know. Also, stay hydrated. I love you. I love you too. In order to save money on my flights, I ended up flying out of a small airport in Victoria, Texas to the Houston airport. The hopper flight was in a super tiny airplane and the turbulence had me holding my seat and my lunch. The hour-long flight felt like an eternity and I vowed I would never put myself through it again. The rest of the flights were long, but uneventful, and I arrived safely in Perth, Australia. After my colleagues and I got over our jet lag, we set off to the wilderness of Western Australia to study lizards. My field of research requires samples from these remote locations, so the convenience and luxuries of modern living were replaced with true primitive camping. My cozy bed turned into a small air mat which sprung a leak the first night. Air conditioning made way for dry heat and flies. And the toilet was replaced with a small shovel. 
Along the way, there were flat tires, bugs, and sharp foliage, but also quite a bit of natural beauty. Nights were lonely. On my side of the world, my imagination ran wild with images of Alicia's adventures in the outback. Occasionally, Alicia was within cell phone range and could text with me. These brief conversations helped ease my mind and made the time go by just a little bit quicker. Somewhere around the halfway point of my trip, my feet and hands began to swell. One day I looked down at my feet and barely recognized them, they were so big. Work was going very well though, and the daily tasks kept me busy. After a month of camping, it was great to return to Perth. I felt like a real person again, and laid down in a nice bed. It was then I noticed it was getting harder to see my toes. Can you bring me my tea? Oh, my bladder. Help me up. The energy I found during the latter half of my second trimester had now given way to feelings of heaviness and exhaustion. Nights became a game of chance in my constant war with acid reflux. This led to some very creative pillow placements. Can I mention the crazy loud snoring too? No. There were other surprising things deprived of me due to my state. Hot baths got replaced by lukewarm ones. We should really start forming a birth plan. I also couldn't use any fancy bath products since I heard it was safer to use the gentlest cleansers you can find. That's not to say there weren't perks to having such a large belly. It made for a very interesting conversation starter at the awkward Christmas party we attended. The third trimester also marked the time where we decided to get serious about preparing for the birth and future as parents. The time had come for the classes. We enrolled in a birthing class that went over all the things you can expect in the hospital we chose, including everything that can go wrong. The class also devoted time to breathing exercises. <laughs> And there was a prerequisite how to change a diaper lesson. But trust me, it doesn't take long to become an expert in this department. With a head full of knowledge, we were beginning to feel ready for the big day. <clears throat> we need to write the birth plan out still. Oh, right. As the days moved closer and closer on our countdown calendar, I began to feel increasingly anxious. I was ready to get this thing going as my level of discomfort grew with itchy stretch marks, acid reflux, and an obviously giant belly. Hey, you look like you're ready to pop! Yeah, I know, right? I'm as big as a freaking whale! Yeah, I was ready. Our hospital bag was packed with all the essentials, our car seat was ready to go, the nursery was ridiculously close to being complete. Now all we had to do was wait. And write out our birth plan. Remember? We were days from the expected due date, and I was trying everything I could to get things moving along. Don't worry, it'll happen soon. Any day now, I suspect. Yeah, I know. Good night, honey. Good night. Eric. Hmm. Eric. Yeah, sweetheart. I think my water just broke. Sorry, sugar. 
I must have dozed off again. Well, I really think my water broke. Should we go to the hospital? Are you having contractions? No, I don't think so. I think we're supposed to wait till contractions start. We should probably rest, too. We're going to need all the energy we can get. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pack the car anyways, in case we have to make a mad dash for the hospital. You sound excited. After packing the car, Eric went straight back to sleep. I, however, couldn't help but stay up a little while longer trying to feel for any signs that the time had really come. I thought my water had broken, but it wasn't dramatic like in the movies. To put it bluntly, it was either a leak from a punctured sack, or I kept peeing myself a little. Which is something a pregnant woman unfortunately has to deal with occasionally. I may have napped a bit, but I definitely didn't sleep that night. Anything? I really can't tell. I think we should head into the hospital so they can check and see if my water really is broken. I don't think we should risk the possibility of my bacteria seeping through the ruptured membrane and mixing with the amniotic fluid. All right, let's do this. As we locked the door, the thought occurred to us that our lives as a duo were about to end. The time had come to say a fond farewell and step into a new adventure together. Should I grab the stuff? Not yet. They may send us right home. Alright, I'm going to take this back and see if there's any signs of amniotic fluid. I'll be right back. It's a nice room. Yeah. Can you see this being where Lily is born? Yeah. I think I can. Okay guys, looks like you're here to stay. Get comfortable. You heard her. Well, my water had broken, but no contractions yet. The nurse put me on a pill called Cytotec in order to soften my cervix and help my labor progress. I got comfortable in a gown I had purchased specifically for the occasion. It was actually very nice. It was 5 p.m. and still nothing. We decided since there is no going back now, it was time to call the folks. Yes, I'm already at the hospital. It could be a while still. Oh, you're coming now? Okay. Mom? Mom? I think she hung up on me. How do you feel? I think it's starting. Oh. Our plan was to keep the birth as natural as possible. This meant no pain medication, and definitely no epidural. The thought of a needle in my back didn't seem at all appealing. Alicia's belly was being monitored constantly via a strap-on piece of equipment. We now had up-to-the-second status updates on Lily's heartbeat. We were getting to know pretty much everybody who worked in the hospital as shift changes rotated every nurse on staff through our room. Alright, let's check that cervix. After several hours of increasingly intense contractions, I thought for sure we were on the right track. Well, unfortunately you're still only at one centimeter dilation. I'm going to recommend Pitocin to help your body along. Let's do it. This is when things started to get rather intense. Oh. I feel like someone's taking an axe to my back. Should you try your breathing exercises? He, 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 oh, he, he, he. Oh. I quickly discovered the best way to help Alicia cope with her pain was to shut up and be an object for her to hold on to, like a stone. 
I also started noticing a strange quirk she used to help her with the pain. She fidgeted with her fingers as if she was counting. Besides her fingers moving in the occasional but small exclamation, oh. Alicia was surprisingly silent. Alicia, I think your mom is outside the room. Do you want me to let her in? No visitors. I can't let them see me like this. Somewhere around four in the morning, my water officially burst, but at least it gave Eric something to do. On it. It took every towel in the room to handle the situation. I'm sorry to say, but you're still only at one centimeter. It had been over 24 hours since my water broke, with no progression. With the pain oh. becoming unbearable, I made the decision to go through with an epidural. Part of me felt like I was letting myself down for going this route. Childbirth is not just about the parent, though, and I was willing to do whatever it took to get things moving. It was nice seeing Alicia finally able to relax again, but while she drifted off to a happier state of mind, a new drama began to unfold. Her blood pressure's dropping. We need to get as much fluid in her as possible. She's shaking. Should she be shaking? It's a common reaction to the epidural. Try not to worry. She's stabilized. Whew. Hey, how do you feel? Fantastic. Oh, good. For an hour, we both got some much needed rest. But when morning came, it came with a fever. Oh. We're gonna need to get you on some antibiotics and off the Pitocin because of this fever. Also, your cervix just won't dilate. I'm gonna try to manually stretch it. Two stretching sessions later and my cervix was finally getting somewhere, but still not enough to enter the final stage of labor. It had now been over 36 hours since my water had broken, and my contractions were slowing down instead of ramping up. We were given the option to give it two more hours and hope for the best, or head into the OR for a C-section. At this point, the decision was easy. It was time to have this baby. We have to take her into prep now. Someone will come get you shortly. I'll be there soon, sweetheart. The next 15 minutes were some of the longest I've ever experienced. I spent some of it updating anxious family members. <gasps> the rest of the time, I paced around the hallways in a part of the hospital usually off limits to the public. Being a curious person, I peeked around at stuff, but always gravitated back to the operating room door. Gosh, how long is this going to take? Do they forget about me? Okay, we're ready for you. Laying on the operating table was an interesting experience. I was curious about the procedure and watched in fascination as the doctor and the staff whirled around like a well-oiled machine. It was only a matter of minutes before our baby would be born. Nine months of wondering what she was going to look like finally coming to an end. The anticipation was intense. You're gonna feel a lot of pressure, like someone sitting on your chest. Just relax. I can't believe this is really about to happen. Do you feel okay? Uh-huh. She's perfect. The first hour after Lily's birth, the golden hour as it's called, we snuggled and tried out nursing. Given the dramatic events of the birth, however, Lily had to be taken away for four hours into the NICU. Eric went with her while I attempted to rest from my surgery. 
The four hours flew by in what felt like minutes as several nurses swarmed around doing all manner of tests. Lily also had her first bath, which I gotta say, she didn't seem to enjoy. I watched as she transformed in color and demeanor into a crazy lobster baby. Meanwhile, I was going through the beginnings of a rough recovery. Anxious family members were gathered around, awaiting Lily's return, as I tried, unsuccessfully, to keep from throwing up. Before we knew it, Lily and I were able to head back down to Alicia. The recovery room they set us up in was Mm. super nice. It almost felt like a hotel. Almost. Over the next several hours, we entertained a steady stream of visitors, ready to spoil us in food, flowers, and well wishes. When the dust settled, we both took some much needed rest. Well, sort of. Lily came to this world with her own sleep schedule, and it didn't necessarily mesh with ours. Because Alicia wasn't allowed to hold Lily unsupervised due to her medication, I took the first night shift and stayed up cuddling and watching samurai films with my daughter. When you're in recovery, it's actually quite difficult to find time to rest. On top of nursing Lily every two hours, nurses were coming in the room frequently to check on the two of us. Recovering from a C-section is rough business. I developed something called postpartum puffs, which is a cute name for an incredibly itchy belly. 36 hours after my epidural, it was finally time to try to stand on my own. As I got out of bed, I felt like I was going to fall through the floor. Over the next few days, I slowly tried to get used to walking around again. Heading to the restroom was a highly uncomfortable endeavor for a number of reasons. All things aside, it was nice to have this extended time in the hospital. Before we knew it, our bags were packed and I was downstairs making sure the car seat was properly installed. Less than an hour later, we were driving off into the sunrise and headed into the next big adventure of our lives, the so-called fourth trimester. Welcome to your new home. Oh, right. We have pets. Our house was already full before we brought Lily home, and now introducing a new life into the mix came with challenges. The first order of business was introducing Lily to everyone. Gaia is our oldest and generally most calm pet. Sleeping for lengths of time is her favorite hobby, and eating is her passion. Our major concern with her was getting too comfy around Lily, like falling asleep on her head comfy. As expected, she took to Lily very well. Luna, on the other hand, was a bigger concern. Luna is, hands down, the craziest cat I've ever met. She's the type of cat that randomly freaks out at the drop of an invisible hat. She'll eat your cords. No, not my headphones. Thinks biting is affection. Ow, my toe. And will let you know when it's time for food in the rudest possible ways. She was pretty indifferent about Lily, though, and so long as her needs were met, she was good. Kazi. Kazuo took to Lily in a very different way. Kazuo has always been a strange dog. He likes affection, but rarely returns the favor. He's maybe licked my hand twice, which was always a big deal. In demeanor, he's more like a cat than a dog. He doesn't understand pointing. He's not very food motivated. And he's never really seemed all that interested in typical dog things. His response to Lily? Fear. Kazuo was very, very scared of Lily for the first month or so. If she moved unexpectedly, he'd panic. In time, she would become his beacon of hope by introducing him to floor food and igniting that dormant part of his dog brain that loves all things edible. Well, I think they're going to be cool with her. Yeah. With introductions out of the way, we began to settle into life at home with a newborn. We were starting to get to know Lily more intimately, and it was completely fascinating 
Little aspects of her personality were starting to take shape, and we were in love. We would soon discover that Lily's love was a bit, shall I say, demanding. 